How's everybody doing? Yeah? Coming right after lunch, so this is good. Food is not standing between us. Hi. <laughs> good to see you again. Uh, making new friends here. So um, this is a good track that we have coming up here um, for people who are interested in the space. Um, you know, we've known for a while that layer one was never going to scale um, to the point of serving all of humanity. And so we expected there to be some hierarchy. And I'm really happy to have a couple of the founders from the teams uh, here in this hour to give you their you know, past year, what they're expecting for the next year, as well as answer some questions that we've gotten from the audience as well as some of mine. Um, I'm gonna start off, this is Ben here from Optimism. Great guy, nice guy, uh, really cool technology. And he's gonna start off our hour track here. Um, and I think the format is going to be that you're gonna give a couple of slides you prepared, you know, five, 10 minutes, um, you know, pretty brief, but the highlights so people kind of have that. And then you and I are gonna do a Q and A. So, floor is yours. Let's do it. Thanks, yeah. Robert. Can y'all hear me all right? Yes, yay, I see some nods. Cool, what's up y'all? Well, Robert just said who I am, but I'm Ben. It is nice to see you all. Um, I work at a company called Optimism, and we are building some really cool scaling tech. Also, follow me on Twitter. My pastime is making uh, Ethereum parody songs. So if you're interested in seeing some very cringy uh, song parodies that are crypto themes, check me out. Okay, real quick, what are we building? Optimism is building a protocol called Optimistic Ethereum. What is that? It is a layer two optimistic rollup. What does that mean? That means that we are basically like a side chain. So it's a separate chain that you can interact with just like you do Ethereum and do all those lovely Ethereum things. But it has security that is rooted in the layer one. What is that layer one? That layer one is Ethereum. So effectively, it is like an Ethereum chain that's been shoved in in such a way that is much cheaper and gives you fast instant transactions but it still gives you the ability to go and challenge things on layer one, and so it doesn't uh, make a, a big sacrifice on security. So that's what Optimus Ethereum is. Does that all make sense? Can I see some nods? Oh yeah, cool stuff. Okay, hopefully you guys have all heard that before. Okay, so what's been going on with us? Um, we've been live on Mainnet for the better part of a year now. Uh, we've done several million transactions and tens of millions of dollars saved in fees because everything is cheaper in a roll-up, baby. That's what you like to see. And our, of course, our statistic isn't like a DeFi TVL because money isn't locked when it's on Optimus Ethereum. It's in use on Optimus Ethereum. It's been deposited in and people are moving it around. So that's my TVD total value deposited meme. There we go. Okay, so that's what we've been doing for the past year. What's going on now? Well, last week we announced our biggest upgrade to date. We are super pumped. What is this upgrade doing? It is moving from EVM compatibility to EVM equivalence. What on earth does that mean? Well, basically it means that at a very low level of the stack, the software that is running on layer two matches exactly what you expect on layer one. So if you've built a contract or any system that is targeting the Ethereum chain, you can reapply that target to layer two. This is very, very exciting. This is a huge breakthrough because it goes all the way down to the smallest minutia of what actually runs on Ethereum. Great, and we're rolling it out soon. Next month, October, get hyped, woo! Okay, what, is that, what does that really mean? So I did have a, a couple of meme slides that I would just decided to share quickly. Basically what it means is for the past year we've been an EVM compatible rollup. This means that you can run your EVM contracts, but it's on a different software stack. So if you pull off the mask, what you see is this big monstrosity of code that you get to get that security rooted in layer one. That is a hard problem. It was not something that when Ethereum was built, it was set out to do. And this makes it really, really, really tricky. Now, with this upgrade, if you have an EVM equivalent rollup and you take off the mask, you see the exact same Ethereum infrastructure that's in use on layer one, but in use on layer two. And in fact, our goal is to do this in less than 1,000 lines of code. That is going to be huge. That means that everything about the Ethereum ecosystem that you know and love will port into layer two, and in fact, it will be the same thing. It's really bringing Ethereum into layer two as opposed to building an Ethereum compatible layer two. So that is what we are super excited about and just announced, and that is what I want to say. The last thing I want to say is try it out. We are live, gateway.optimism.io, and follow us on Twitter. That's our Twitter handle. Check it out. Okay, so that's my spiel. We'll get some questions now. Thanks, y'all. All right. Good. A lot of energy. 
Always. Always. Got to stay ben, optimistic. Ben's signature. <laughs> optimistic team. Optimism is, is the great, one of the great names for companies that I've ever seen. So um, let's see. Um, one of the things, uh, you just mentioned it at the, this last uh, slide here about EVM compatibility. I was curious if, uh, you know, did you guys just kind of, you know, especially with this new announcement going to full EVM compatibility um, and doing it, you know, uh, in a roll-up context is a pretty major thing. Um, it's kind of been in the works because you guys were steering along with EVM for a long time. Was this sort of a master plan that you guys knew or, you know, a year ago, a lot of people were thinking about, you know, uh, developers and systems were going to move to WASM. They'd be willing to go to domain-specific languages if they need to. And now we've kind of seen, I mean, this is one of the big uh, trends now that we've discovered at L2 is that, you know, just like in the history of, uh, of computers and so forth, software matters. You know, Intel x86 architecture stuck around for 40 years, 50 years, <laughs> not because it was the best, it was one of the worst, but software compatibility is king. So, I mean, what, you know, give us a little perspective on, on how much was that luck and how much was that brilliance? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm, you're setting me up for a dunk on that. It's all brilliance, baby, come on now. Um, okay, so what's that, what's that journey been like? Okay, so uh, before, we were, before uh, we were known as Optimism, we were actually working on a scaling tech called Plasma. Mm -hmm. And that works in a similar manner in that it uh, secures things in the L1, but it does so a little bit differently. It has a little bit of a different design. As a matter of fact, it's actually more scalable. You can actually run more plasma chains through an L1 than you can uh, rollups. But this also had problems. And the big problem was that you couldn't run Ethereum-style applications. Mm -hmm. And that basically meant that we were thinking about these plasma chains as their own sort of thing. We were like, people were thinking maybe there will be custom domain specific plasma chains that are really good for one application or the other. And we mm -hmm. were developing this generalized plasma, which gave us a way to basically build applications on top of plasma. The problem is that fundamentally those things couldn't give you the same properties of Ethereum. And especially the one that really mattered there was the unstoppability. So basically the way that this, that, that this was the case is that someone could, you know, a plasma system, censor the application for a period of time, and this basically meant that the application halted and people couldn't know the state mm -hmm. of the application. And this meant that things like Uniswap were really problematic because imagine if you had a Uniswap system where there was a failure mode where you couldn't send transactions to it or rebalance anything or know whether or not those transactions were going through. And so that was a problem. So, that was a couple of years ago when we finally found rollups as sort of the solution to that problem. And we realized that, oh, oh my goodness, now we can do full Ethereum style applications, no compromises. Mm -hmm. So that was really, really exciting. Um, and that was sort of the first step along that, that journey. So immediately after that, what we sort of looked to was, okay, we finally have this research that has really gone well. We understand that we can build these apps. How do we take that into production? How do we move that into reality? And the first step to doing that was to basically build nodes. I mean, in some ways, this is what you have to do, right? If you have a blockchain, you have these decentralized nodes. They're verifying the chain or producing blocks in the chain. And it sort of became a question of how, what, what does that software get written in? How do you do that? And the answer, which feels like, like a leading question because it is, is that you should use Ethereum. If we have a layer two that's supposed to look and feel mm -hmm. just like Ethereum, it has all those properties, and we want it to be as close to Ethereum as possible, what software should we use? Well, the answer is the Ethereum software, namely Geth, the Go Ethereum stack. Mm -hmm. So we started off on that journey uh, with a fork of Geth, um, and, we, that, and that, that, that first iteration was something we called the OVM. Mm -hmm. And that was basically what we thought at the time was our minimal way to make some changes to Geth to get it to support layer two in a way that would be good. Mm -hmm. uh, that, so that went well, and that was our first stab at that. This announcement is definitely the evolution of thinking there. And like if I were to say, oh, there's some brilliance, yeah, maybe I could, maybe I would, maybe I would be excited and say that. Uh, but I think the real point of it is that we basically re-examined things and we decided to double down. And what doubling down meant for us is that this thing shouldn't just run EVM contracts. You shouldn't just be able to put solidity on it. It should run EVM exactly as it does. And it turns out there's a thing called the Ethereum yellow paper. If you guys have seen the Ethereum white paper, that was like one of the early inspiring things in my crypto uh, career that got me super pumped about Ethereum. The yellow paper is like the opposite of that. It's like this massive 30-page tome of all of these very you know, technical math descriptions that precisely define every part of Ethereum. Mm -hmm. 
And it turns out that when we first went after this problem, we underestimated how valuable it was to match that exactly. Mm -hmm. Because if you match that exactly, then all of the tooling and all of the infrastructure that is built around that very precise specification can be used. So it's definitely an evolution. It's definitely something new. And I think the way that it's new is we're just like doubling down on matching the EVM perfectly. Mm -hmm. So there's a long-winded answer all to right. that question. All right, cool. <laughs> Good answer. I think it's important for people to know some of the history behind these things. Um, and uh, you know, it is, a, it is a pretty rich history. That's uh, definitely one thing we've gotten with Ethereum. Um, <clears throat> OK, this one is, if that was more of like potentially a softball question, this one's maybe a little more hardball. Um, so you know, uh, obviously, you know, L2s in general mean scaling layer ones. And um, you know, there's a wide variety of types of L2, sidechains being one of the easiest ones. And getting EVM compatibility is not hard. You just spin up and run an EVM chain, a la you know, BSC or a you know, number of other players have done that. What they lack, though, is security, right? And so the name of the game of rollups is borrowing or paying for the security of layer one through this deposit withdrawal anchor contract by being able to prove to layer one that the withdrawals are valid. And um, you know everything comes with trade-offs. You don't get anything for free in this world. And security like this comes with uh, trade-offs. There's two general types of roll-ups. There are fraud-proof based security roll-ups and validity proof, uh, otherwise known as uh, zero knowledge uh, proof roll-ups. Uh, one of the trade-offs that a lot of people talk about on the validity proof is that it has a much uh, better capital efficiency because the amount of time the capital has to be committed before it is ensured to be safe to take in withdrawal can be you know, on the order of minutes versus on the order of a week or two. So I, I don't know, what, do you, uh, do you, what kind of perspectives do you give people for the, you know, the, the fate of optimistic roll-ups, uh, you know, given we have been seeing a lot of advancement on the ZK roll-up side as well. Totally. So I, I think that ZK technology is amazing. It is mm -hmm. absolutely incredible. And if there was anything that I could have pulled back the mask to reveal even more complex than 50,000 lines of spaghetti code, it would be some of the stuff going into zero knowledge proofs. But that is wonderful. That is very exciting. And it's incredible research that we track actively. Um, I do think it will take a while for us to get to EVM equivalence, which is this thing that we're realizing is massively, massively valued. Mm -hmm. In general, I do think that it is a significant trade-off with these optimistic roll-ups that you have this withdrawal time. So the reason that we get security and cheaper transactions with optimistic roll-ups is that you basically don't do anything with those transactions up front. You sort of timestamp them and, for, and in some sense forget about them other than a little hash. And if anyone posts something that is sort of fraudulent, as you mentioned, you can prove and, or challenge and submit a dispute that corrects the system. And so there has to be a period of time in which you can do that. And this is this withdrawal time you were alluding to, which people think, uh, or which people rightfully say will, it will impact capital efficiency. I think it remains to be seen. I, I think we're just getting to some mm -hmm. of these answers now as more roll-ups mm -hmm. and start to come online and we see more value coming, coming into them, how that's going to play out. One note is that uh, capital efficiency for withdrawals isn't necessarily bad depending on the volume in and out of the chain. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine that you have uh, you know, $100 being deposited per minute mm -hmm. and $100 being withdrawn per minute, actually what you should do is you should swap the two people's assets. So mm -hmm. instead of making this person wait for a week to withdraw and make this person deposit another $100, you should simply allow this person for L1 money to buy the L2 money. Mm -hmm. and vice versa. And so you can do that in a trustless way. And we're starting to see projects like that come online. So these are like the explosion of bridge protocols, shout out to Hop Exchange, Connects, Nova, all those projects. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll, we'll have to see in practice how those economics play out. It could be the case that if, if people are moving the same money in and out of the chain, that there's no problem with efficiency. Um, mm -hmm. But we'll have to see. OK. All right. Good, good, good answer. Um, is uh, you know, optimism and the, you know, your roll up is it sort of end of the line on optimistic, or do you have uh, you know, in your mind's eye a roadmap that eventually would include something from ZK? Just curious. We, de we definitely do. I think that um, for us, the bar is extremely high for Ethereum compatibility. Mm -hmm. So like being able to run contracts is something that brought us to rollups in the first place. In fact, 
one of our resistances to rollups early on were that they're not as scalable as the tech that we were working on before. Mm -hmm. But we realized that the advantage that you get from being able to run Ethereum that you know and love mm -hmm. is so big that it's worth it. And, and we realized that the users would be willing to make that, that trade off. So that is an extremely high bar that we will not back down on. But mm -hmm. it's definitely the case that ZK proofs are moving along very quickly. And if they come along and start really solving some of these hard questions, then we'll have to incorporate it. OK, all right. Uh, another question I have that I think should be uh, of interest to everybody in the audience here, whether you're a user of a technology like uh, rollups for getting uh, you know, more access to uh, um, you know, faster transactions, lower cost transactions, uh, better user experience, or if you're a developer, if you're, you know, if you're uh, a Uniswap or uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Compound or somebody else looking for venues in which to do your transactions. Um, or if you are an investor uh, trying to figure out which of the governance tokens or you know, tokens that start popping up um, you know, behind the networks for these L2s. One, one question is, you know, is the L2 space going to tend towards kind of a power law, winner takes all, or is it going to tend towards a team of rivals with healthy competition? So you're in the space, you know, you're living, breathing it 24-7. Um, what, what sort of inklings do you have uh, philosophically or you know, any signs that you're seeing of how the market is starting to play out? Yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely think that competition I've met you before. ...and to give users the choice to make choices between security trade-offs and cost trade-offs and all of this stuff. So I think that's really good. I think another... So it's interesting. The question that you ask is one that we ask internally a lot, but we pose it a little bit of a different way. Mm -hmm. And the question that we ask is, how do you quantify the economic value of composability? And what we call this in like more technical jargon is like a synchronous state space. Right? So Ethereum sort of became famous with DeFi because it had these money Legos. Right? Anytime someone deploys a Uniswap or a Compound or a new thing, anyone else could deploy a contract that talks to all 15 of those contracts at once. And there's all this crazy MEV and flash loans and all this stuff. Right? So the question of how will we see the distribution of value on rollups comes down to what is the value of being on the same rollup, at, uh, same rollup as another application? Mm -hmm. What is the value of being able to talk to it immediately. Because if you have two applications on two different rollups, they can talk to each other, but it's asynchronous. There's some delay, mm -hmm. and they, you can right. only send a message one way. So you can send a message and wait for a response back that was a separate message being sent, but those occur in separate blocks. Mm -hmm. So a thing like a flash loan, which all occurs in one block, one transaction, you can't do that quite the same way. Right. So this is another question that I'm not sure the answer to, because we have started seeing like the, the, the existence of Polygon and BSC in these chains were different state spaces, and people did gravitate towards them, but they also had lower fees, and then we ended up seeing little mini synchronous composable economies within those chains. So I think that there's definitely value in synchrony, and I definitely think that we, because of that, we will see some chains that have significantly more funds than others. Another thing that people throw out uh, pretty often is that we'll see not application-specific chains, but uh, like category specific chains. So people are like, maybe you'll have your DeFi chain and your NFT chain and your I don't know what else chain name the you know, flavor of the month that we've got going around these days. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I, think we'll, I think we'll see that. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a cop out answer to, for me to say, I don't know, but here's a more technical way to describe the question <laughs> that you're asking. I think, I think in the end, we'll see something like a power law, but I do think that if we do decentralization well, there'll be a good spread. Yeah, well, I think uh, you know, in all honesty, you'd have to really be crystal balling it. To you know, to know for sure, um, but it's an interesting space, and you know we've seen it uh, time and again. I mean, uh, having having a formidable competition between people is the way that we get to future velocity and the way to get excellence. So, viva la différence when it comes to layer twos. Um, one final question that I think is a um, good one for us to ask is uh, about the operators. So it is true that in layer two. If the operators, and let's actually talk about what is an operator at layer two. Just like on Ethereum, when you submit a transaction, you're putting it through Infura, and it goes to a whole collection of decentralized miners that are incentivized to order them into blocks. Actually, now it's being done through Flashbots as well, through another protocol, but the original protocol, and then get you know, minted into blocks on Ethereum chain. And so that function doesn't go away. It has to get replaced at layer two with new operators that receive the transactions decide how to put them together, 
you do have you know, minor extractable value or maximal extractable values come, come in again if you're familiar with that problem that started to emerge as DeFi and ordering and transactions and front running became very valuable. Um, but the question is uh, you know, the operator role. Um, you know, it's uh, definitely everybody kind of launches it very centralized, um, but what are the plans uh, that you guys have or what do you envision is possible to do at layer two uh, or is it even needed to actually try to get to an Ethereum-like decentralization of op op operators? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So one of the exciting things about layer two is that you can constrict that space a little bit and in particular, because everything that happens on layer two is based on what happens on layer one, and layer one is censorship resistant, there's a much lower switching cost for layer twos mm -hmm. and for rollups than there are for layer ones. So because they're not so independent chains, they're sort of rooted in the L1, mm -hmm. there's no way, even if the, this centralized sequencer or operator were to be totally compromised, there's no way for them to, for instance, censor transactions that are moving to another chain. So what I think we will definitely see with layer two is we'll see an explosion of experiments in different models for block production and how that is handled. Well, when you say it's not possible to censor it, you mean there in the sense that the operators could choose not to put it the layer two, but the user has the layer one contract exit that they can force their transaction to appear at layer one. Correct, correct, okay. correct. And just not just to pull clear. their money out, that's like the most common, that's mm -hmm. the most important thing to be able to do to make it a low switching cost. Mm -hmm. But they can send all their transactions totally bypassing that, that sequencer if they want to. Yeah, and more importantly, the reputational cost of the operator goes, you know, takes a massive hit if they're seen, you know, yes. forcing users to have to use that path. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I didn't hear in there, so is there a plan that you guys are going to do some kind of progressive central decentralization or federation of operators or something? Absolutely. So before MEV was the big, huge thing that it is now, actually, mm -hmm. that was one of the early research posts that we put out, was we said, hey, guys, you can sell the right, you can auction off the right to be a block proposer on layer two and use this money to fund public goods. This is a very valuable thing that we are going to do. Uh, what that means in practice is not so nefarious as maximize the MEV, right? You, you want a balance between users being pleased with the system and being able, be able to extract that value. But fundamentally, that is a, like the role of that thing is to have a uh, mechanism by which sequencers can be rotated out mm -hmm. and a mechanism by which you democratize the ability to sequence mm -hmm. uh, by creating a secondary market. Mm -hmm. So it is on the roadmap. I think we have a post coming out soon that is gonna lay down the law a little bit more than that two years old ETH research post is because some people okay. have taken that a little bit differently than because it was written in the pre-dark forest days. <laughs> ah. um, but, it's, but it's absolutely still on the roadmap. We're super excited about okay. it. Okay, very good, very good. All right, well, thank you. It's a quick session, so that's all the questions that we had between the audience and my questions together. But really terrific to hear the update and congratulations on you know the new uh, full EVM compatibility release that you guys are doing. Equivalent. Love to see things. It equivalent. was compatible, now it's equivalent, baby. Equivalent, okay, <laughs> all right, semantics. Thank you, Robert, all right. appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you. <laughs>